We have activities going on in the life of our church. Let me just point your attention to page six of your bulletin. Uh, this coming Saturday, men's breakfast, and then a week later, uh, women's spring brunch. And, and all I can say about this advertisement is that it shows the difference between men and women. A uh, very healthy picture of a breakfast there for the men and a lovely design for the spring brunch coming up for women. Uh, it is a delight to gather to worship the true and living God. God has revealed himself. And in doing this, as one writer has said, he embraces the feebleness of our understanding, the strength of our fears, the shattered state of our nerves, the violence of our temptations, our readiness to sink into melancholy, and everything calling for tender compassions. As we prepare our hearts for worship, hear these words from Matthew chapter 3. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Worship is from Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning acknowledging what is sometimes difficult to behold, but what is such a blessing for us to know and to treasure, that your dominion is an everlasting dominion, and your kingdom endures from generation to generation, you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Oh Lord, we adore you this morning for your staggering sovereignty. We worship you because what you have promised you are able to perform, and we give glory to you for upholding our breath and our life this morning. And we especially praise you that by your sovereign hand you have redeemed us into your Son, our Savior, by his death for sin and his resurrection for our salvation. 
And we ask you this morning that you would bring glory to your name, that you would send the Spirit who searches hearts to revive us, to strengthen and renew us until the day that we behold him through whom you have loved us with a sovereign and almighty love, and you have loved us and will love us to the very end. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, there is a God in heaven this morning who does all that he pleases, and he's been pleased to work our salvation, and this salvation is grounded in what we confess this morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, let's stand and sing the hymn version of Psalm 135, hymn 12, Exalt the Lord, His Praise Proclaim. I ask you to remain standing for our first scripture reading. Scripture reading is from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 5. Hear the word of your God given for your edification. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? 
Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. May the Lord bless our hearts for the reading of his word. Please be seated. Let us pray together a prayer of confession. Our great Father in heaven, you are holy. You are the Holy One of Israel. A day and night, the cherubim declare your majesty. You are set apart. You are entirely other. Yet you have been pleased. Yet you have desired to make a people for yourself out of love. The Apostle Paul says, In love you predestined us for adoption as sons, choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world. What shall we do to repay you? Or what can we give? We have nothing other than expressing our deepest thanksgiving. But we have failed to do so. We have busied ourselves with life. We have failed to acknowledge your love. We have failed to give you thanksgiving for your eternal electing purposes. We grew proud instead of humbling ourselves under your mighty hand. We did not acknowledge that all that we have and all that we have received is a free gift that we do not deserve. We have sinned times without number in word, thought, and behavior. We are guilty of pride and of unbelief. We are guilty of neglect to seek you in daily life. We, do not, we did not live up to the standard of our Christian calling. We have not worked out our salvation in fear and trembling. Gracious Father, forgive us. If you, if you should mark iniquity, who could stand? We appeal to your mercy uh, through the blood of Jesus, who, as the final lamb, poured his life for our forgiveness on his cross. Have mercy on us and wash us clean in his blood. We ask that you build us up for good works, purge all ungodliness, remove from us all self-seeking, destroy every occasion for sin, subdue our corruptions. Fill us with your spirit that we may know to live above the corruptions of the flesh. Let not the passions of the flesh and the lusts of the mind bring our spirits and hearts into subjection, but rule over us in liberty and power. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance of pardon from Micah 7. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain the anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Let us now stand and sing hymn 466, I sought the Lord and afterward I knew.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and the certainty of your promise therein. For we know, O Lord, that the word of your power will not return to you void and empty, but will accomplish that purpose for which you sent it. We thank you for salvation which is only found in Christ. We thank you for the mystery of your purpose of election, that before the ages began you set apart a people for yourself, for holiness and blessedness and glory. Indeed, your glory is manifest in your steadfast love for your people. And we thank you, O Lord, that you do have mercy on whom you will have mercy and compassion on whom you will have compassion. And thus we pray, gracious God, according to your great mercy and compassion, would you be so pleased as to use our tithes and offerings for the glory of your eternal purposes. And we pray these things for Christ's glory and in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Let us stand and sing the words of the doxology. Please be seated. And would you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, indeed, who is like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of your inheritance? Surely you do not retain anger forever, for you delight in steadfast love. And heavenly Father, we pray that we would delight as well 
as we consider the mystery of your steadfast love for us. Oh, what wondrous love is this, that by grace alone you've taken us into the number of your children, and that you've put your name upon us and given us a right to all the privileges of the children of God. And what wondrous love is this, that we've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, who seals us as well for the day of redemption and the glorious inheritance of everlasting life. Oh, Lord, we pray that it would be so for all those whom you have set apart. We pray for the salvation of friends and family who have not believed. We pray that the gospel would continue to go forth to the hearts of all those whom you've appointed for salvation. And even so, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would hasten the day of redemption, hasten the day when faith shall become sight, hasten the day when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow, and all will marvel at your eternal purposes for a people in Christ. And until that day should come, O oh Lord, we pray for an increase of faith, and we pray that, uh, for an increase of faith that we might submit to your revealed will. And we pray that in all things, not least our salvation over which you exercise perfect wisdom and power, that we would glorify your name and extol your greatness. For who is like you, gracious God? Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? For from you and by you and to you are all things. And we give you glory forever and ever. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's continue in our worship as we stand and sing the words of the Gloria Patri. <laughs> Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would enable us this day to have a greater sense, a greater conviction that your word is true and utterly trustworthy. We pray that in these moments together, you would grant us a deeper understanding of that word and that you would enable us to apply the word to our own hearts, that we might walk in faith and obedience all of our days. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I ask that you'd remain standing as you're able for the reading of our sermon text. We continue in our sermon series in the book of Romans, and this morning we come to Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. Romans 9, 6 through 13. I ask that you would listen now as I read, for this is the very Word of God. The Apostle Paul writes, but it is not as though the Word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named." This means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Well, it's a simple calculation, one that we all make every day. We do it every time we make a purchase of some kind. 
every time we consider the words of a political candidate and we cast a vote, we do it essentially every time we rely on another human being to do something for us. In some form or fashion, we ask ourselves, can I trust them? Can I trust them? Can I trust their personal character? Can I trust what they say about themselves or their product? Can I trust their track record of performance? Will they actually do what they say they will do? Can I trust them? Now, to be sure, sometimes we invest trust in something or someone, and and there really isn't that much at stake. It doesn't cost us all that much. And if it doesn't work out, we can just pick something else. And so we make these kinds of decisions every day without too much thought or consideration of the matter. But as we go through life, we come upon those moments where we are called to make greater and greater investments. We make purchases or decisions that can cost a great deal. We make decisions where we're truly entrusting our lives to another. We make decisions that can restructure our entire lives and and bind and obligate us for decades or more. Now, in such circumstances, a wise person will engage in as much due diligence as possible. We think the decision over. We consider many factors. We we research details and history because we need to know, is this a good decision? Is it the right decision? We say to ourselves, there's a lot riding on this, so I really need to know, can I trust? Can I depend on all the parties involved? And if, and if along the way any discrepancies pop up, the wise person does not overlook them. No, we, we dig in with a little more fervor, a little more effort and interest. We want to get to the bottom of the matter. We want to remove any doubts. We say to ourselves, if, if I'm going to make this life-changing investment, I need to know, can I trust And can I entrust myself to whatever it is I'm considering? The Apostle Paul seems to understand the the realities of trust and verification. It's, It's right at the heart of what Paul's doing here in Romans 9 through 11. You see, Paul knows as he's presenting his gospel, he is asking Christians to make the greatest of investments. He's asking us to believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in so doing, to entrust our lives and our bodies and our immortal souls, entrust them into the care of the Lord. And Paul knows this is not an empty investment. No, this investment will cost us. Paul has already made it clear in Romans 1 through 8 that that the life in which we follow Jesus by faith, it will ultimately bring glory and eternal blessedness. But he's also made it very clear, before we enter into that glory, we must face all forms of suffering and hardship, even death. We will, as Paul says, we will inherit the kingdom of God with Christ. We will be glorified with Him, provided we suffer with Him, Romans 8, 17. So, so what Paul is telling us here in Romans is that following Jesus by faith will first lead to suffering and groaning and weakness, and then to eternal glory. Now, Paul promises in no uncertain terms that that God's going to preserve his people through the suffering and the weakness. He'll persevere with us and enable us to persevere to the end. So that even if we, and we will, face what he lists in Romans 8, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, 
Even though we are being killed all the day long and regarded as sheep to be slaughtered, Paul says, even in this, we can know we will be more than conquerors. Because Paul says nothing. Not death, not the hardships of life. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And with all of this in mind, what Paul is going to do is he's going to call every Christian to a specific life of obedience, and he's going to lay that out beginning in chapter 12. And so Paul knows there's a lot at stake here. Eternity is at stake. And in order, Paul knows, in order to give ourselves to present-day obedience... Obedience which will surely lead to suffering, groaning, and weakness. Which we believe will lead to the the full glory of eternal salvation. But in order for us to really give ourselves to that path, we have to be able to answer the question, do you really trust God? Do you trust that God will keep His promises? Do you trust that God will do what He says He will do? Because in order to suffer well and give ourselves to the obedience of faith, we have to trust that God will see us through just as he has promised. And Paul knows here in Romans 9 that before he can move on to instruct believers in the nature of that obedience, he has to answer some hard questions. And this is because some discrepancies, or at least apparent discrepancies, have popped up in Paul's gospel presentation. And these discrepancies, if you will, that they threaten to, they threaten to erode trust in God. And rather than simply dismiss the discrepancies like a bad used car salesman saying, don't look over there, Rather than saying, well, don't pay attention to that, right? It's not important, just trust me. No, Paul says, by all means, let's do our best due diligence on the matter. Let's investigate these discrepancies to the full. Because, as Paul can say, I believe that God is trustworthy, fully trustworthy. I believe that his gospel claims can stand up to any amount of due diligence. Paul is convinced that when the matter is fully investigated, we will all see that God is indeed trustworthy and worthy of entrusting ourselves to Him. So that brings us to try to identify, what's the problem here? What's the discrepancy that Paul is really going to spend the next three chapters addressing? Well, the problem in a nutshell is this, that a vast majority of the Jews in Paul's day and going forward do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this reality, at least on the surface, presents a genuine challenge to the trustworthiness of God. So much so that we can clearly see here, some are arguing that Jewish unbelief means that the Word of God has failed. Verse 6. And of course, if the Word of God has already failed, one would be a fool to trust that same Word and to trust in that same God going forward. So what's the heart of the argument here? How does Jewish unbelief provide an occasion for some to say that the Word of God has failed? Well, I think we can lay out the argument and, and, and say that it goes something like this. Number one, God promises He will preserve all His children in saving faith to the end. We see this promise laid out very clearly by Paul in Romans 8. Paul there argues that, that, that for all of God's children, for all those who have been adopted as sons and filled with the Spirit and united to Christ, God will preserve them, persevere with them, and cause them to persevere in faith. So that at the end of the day, Paul can say, as we've already said, nothing will be able to separate his children from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And this promise is the destiny of all the children of God. That's number one. The second part of the argument is this, that number two, the Jews, and by this we mean ethnic Jews, physical descendants from Abraham, the Jews are the children of God. Paul would seem to support this at some level because he says in verses 4 and 5 that to the Jews belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. The Jews have received, Paul says, the adoption and the promises. These things belong to them. All right, point two. The third part of the argument is then quite simple. Most of the Jews, to whom belong all these blessings, they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not believe in Jesus, who is the Christ, God over all, and thus they are not saved. Which means they're separated from the saving love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul acknowledges this, right? This is why he has such sorrow and anguish in his heart for his unbelieving countrymen. This is why he longs for and prays for their salvation in Romans 10.1. And thus, if these three things are all the case, it would seem that God's promise to preserve his children, in this case the Jews, and cause them to persevere in faith, that promise has failed. And if this is the case, this has dire consequences for Paul's present preaching of the gospel. Scholar Douglas Moo puts it this way, he writes, if the Old Testament teaches that that belonging to physical Israel in itself makes a person a member of God's true spiritual people, then Paul's gospel is in jeopardy. For if this were the case, the gospel, which proclaims that only those who believe in Jesus Christ can be saved, that gospel would contradict the Old Testament and be cut off from its indispensable historical roots. And Moo continues, if God had indeed reneged on his earlier word, the consequences are dire for more than just the Jews. For how could Christians trust such a God to fulfill his promises to them? So now the stakes have been established. The argument against God's Word has been made. The charge is there. God's Word has failed. What we have next then in our verses is Paul's analysis of this argument and his rebuttal. As you may know, when you're analyzing an argument, especially one in which the parts of the argument logically build upon one another, you have to go back and consider each part. You have to ask, is each part of the argument correct? Or are any elements of this argument built on faulty premises? That's what Paul does here. I think we can say with real confidence, Paul is in complete agreement with the first part of the argument. That, that, that part which declares God promises to preserve and persevere with His children so that they persevere in faith through any trial unto glory. We can know Paul is in full agreement with this because he himself has made this argument in chapter 8. And we can say Paul is in total agreement with the third part of the argument in which he acknowledges that many, if not most, of the Jews of his day do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thus are separated from God's salvation. We know this because he himself makes that argument in Romans 9 and 10. But what is clear in our verses this morning is that Paul does not accept the second part of the argument. The the argument that Jews as a simple result of their physical descendants from Abraham, are in fact the true spiritual people of God. And this is where he focuses his energy in our verses to show the the faulty nature of that premise. What, What Paul is going to argue here is that the Word of God has not failed 
Because, as he says, not all who are descended from Israel, those who are the physical descendants of the patriarchs, belong to Israel, and by this he means the true spiritual people of God. He goes on to say, not all are children of Abraham in the spiritual sense, because they are his offspring in the physical sense. This is the heart of Paul's argument, right? That that there is this crucial distinction that must be made between physical descent and spiritual blessing. Paul's essentially arguing here. There's an important distinction between the adoption that belongs to Israel as a corporate people in chapter 9, verse 4, and the spiritual adoption that belongs to individual believing Christians, Jew and Gentile, who are filled with the Spirit and united to Christ, as he argues in Romans 8. Paul acknowledges God has adopted Israel as his firstborn son, as a nation, and given to this corporate people many blessings, which are, in fact, signs of his great salvation. So he has given to them the glory, the covenants, the law, the worship, and the promises, which we looked at last week. But what Paul wants to argue here is that corporate adoption, the giving of these saving signs to this people as a people, it does not mean that every individual Israelite is thus adopted into the true spiritual family of God. Being part of the corporate people of Israel is not identical with receiving God's saving promises in a personal way. Paul's argument hinges on this point, this distinction, that there is in fact this crucial distinction between physical Israel and spiritual Israel. There's a crucial distinction to be made between physical descent, in which, which enables one to belong to a people with certain external spiritual realities given to them and true spiritual adoption in which one receives these saving realities as their own by faith. Now, it's important to understand from the outset, Paul is is not diminishing the significance of Israel's corporate identity. He acknowledges that the call and promises that were made to Abraham are the basis for both physical and spiritual Israel. But Paul knows the Jews of his own day argued that their physical descent from Abraham was the source of their spiritual blessings. They argued that the two, their physical descent and their spiritual blessings were in fact one and the same and could not be separated. Paul here says, while it may be the case that physical descent and spiritual blessing exist together, in particular cases, they are not, in fact, one and the same. Salvation is not a physical birthright. So this is Paul's big claim, right? He's saying this distinction is real, and and if it's real, then it thwarts the argument that's made against God's Word. But the question is, uh, Paul, can you prove that claim? Can you back it up, or are you just saying it? Paul then endeavors to support this claim, this key distinction, with two, you might call them legal exhibits. Exhibit A is Isaac and Ishmael, which we see in verses 7 through 9. What Paul's doing here, he takes us all back to Genesis, in which Abraham is given glorious promises, saving promises, promises that are both for him and for his offspring. Now, of course, when God gives all of these promises to Abraham, he has no offspring. And so, you'll you'll know the story, in an effort, kind of a panicky effort to obtain offspring, Abraham and his wife Sarah agree that Abraham should have a son, and since they don't have a son together, then he should uh, go into Sarah's maidservant Hagar, and through that union, a child is born, Ishmael. But God declares that even though Ishmael is the legitimate child and legal heir of Abraham, 
He is not the child who will inherit the saving promises that God has made to Abraham. Instead, God promises that Sarah herself, in her old age, will bear a son. This son ends up being Isaac, and it is Isaac who will be the descendant of Abraham who receives the spiritual promises and blessing. So you see what's going on here. You have two sons. They both have equal status as physical descendants of Abraham, but only one receives the ultimate promises of salvation. It's not rooted in the boys themselves. It's rooted in God's sovereign choice, the divine extension and gift of God's saving promise. Again, both sons are physical descendants of Abraham, but only one is the spiritual descendant of Abraham in terms of receiving God's saving promises, them being extended to him and to his offspring. Now, Paul could stop here and say, I'm done. I've made my point. And yet he seems to know that some will counter at this point, uh, b- you know, bring a counter argument, and they could say, yes, 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 yes. Isaac and Ishmael are both sons of Abraham. And yes, only one is the ultimate recipient of the saving blessings, but, but it's not like they're totally equal, Paul. I mean, after all, Ishmael was conceived in a totally natural way with this measure of unbelief, whereas Isaac was conceived in a totally supernatural way, given to Sarah in her old age and in her barren condition. They're not the same. So Paul says, okay, let's consider another example. We'll call it Exhibit B, that of Esau and Jacob. Again, stories from the book of Genesis, Abraham's son of the promise, Isaac, and his wife, Rebecca, have two sons. Esau and Jacob. So, so unlike with Ishmael and Isaac, not only did these two boys have the same father, but they had the same mother. And they not only had the same mother, but if you know the story, you'll know that they were twins, conceived at the same time. They lived together in Rebekah's womb at the same time. And yet, Paul points out, before they were ever born, before either had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. And what we see as the story plays out in Genesis is that the saving blessing that was given to Abraham and then given to Isaac, not Ishmael, is then given to Jacob, the younger, and not Esau, the older. Even though Esau and Jacob have identical claims of physical descent, they have the same father, the same mother, the same moment of conception, the same day of birth, what we are told is that God chooses one to be the recipient of the spiritual saving promises of God and not the other. And this act of personal election the choice of Jacob, not Esau. We're told it's not rooted in anything in the boys themselves, but it's only because of God's sovereign call and His will to choose. Now, as we see from uh, the book of the, the ongoing story of the Old Testament and the quote that we'll look at in Malachi, this personal election of one boy over another it ends up having profound corporate implications. Because as we see, as the story progresses, God chooses all 12 of Jacob's sons to be the recipients and the inheritors of the saving blessing so that they become the nation of Israel, whereas Esau's sons end up becoming the nation of Edom. So the election of one boy over another has profound national consequences. And it's in this context of their national identities, Israel and Edom as nations, that Malachi writes his words in Malachi 1, 2, and 3, where he writes, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Very difficult verse. What exactly does it mean? (laughs) So, a little word of explanation here. First, 
we should note that many have argued that because Malachi 1, 2, and 3 is clearly referring to nations, Israel and Edom, they would argue God's election does not actually extend to individuals, but only to corporate bodies who are then chosen by God to play unique roles in the history of redemption. They would argue you cannot argue anything like the Reformed understanding of election and predestination of individuals. You can't argue that, they would say, from Romans 9. Because Paul is only speaking about Edom and Israel as national communities who've been chosen by God to play distinct roles in redemption history. Now, we freely acknowledge it is true that in the Malachi quotation that Paul makes, he, the Malachi quotation is referring to Israel and Edom as nations. You can go back and reread it. It's very clear. And yet, we must remember why, God, why Paul is making the argument of Romans 9 in the first place. He is not trying to argue here in Romans 9 that God has chosen Israel and Edom to exercise different roles and purposes in redemption history. Nobody would argue against that. What he is doing is he is making an argument why God is not unfaithful to choose some Jews for salvation through faith in Christ, while many other Jews, even though they participate in physical descendants from Abraham, do not believe in Jesus and are separated from God's saving love. Paul here is making an argument why some individuals within the same group, that is the ethnic Jews of his own day, why some are chosen by God for salvation, while others within that same group are not. And, and Paul is rooting this argument of his present circumstances in particular examples of God choosing one individual over another within the same group. Two sons of Abraham. God chose Isaac and not Ishmael. Two sons of Isaac. God chose Jacob and not Esau. And yes, we, we freely argue this individual choice has profound corporate implications as the story of the Old Testament goes forth. But what Paul wants to show here is that all those national implications have their roots in the sovereign choice of individuals within the same group. So that God is not now unfaithful if he chooses particular individuals for salvation, but not others, within the same group. Now, another matter we must consider is what exactly does it mean that God hated Esau? What does it mean that he seems to have expressed hatred and contempt for Esau personally and corporately? Now, some have argued that what this means is that God just loves Esau less than Jacob, or he loves Esau in a different way than Jacob, and it's just using this language to try to convey that. Eh, there's a possibility to that, because sometimes the Bible can use hate in this way. Like, like when Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, they're not worthy to be my disciples. Jesus here is not calling for abject hatred of father and mother. He's speaking of love in matters of degree and contrast. He's saying that our love for Jesus must far surpass love for father and mother, and we must love Jesus in an unrivaled way. That's what some will say. That's what is happening here. But, but I think we must acknowledge, if we read the whole Malachi text as it's printed in your bulletin, the text not only speaks of God loving Jacob and Esau differently, in different degrees and in different manners, but it speaks of God exercising, as John Murray says, positive disfavor, disapprobation, and displeasure with Esau and Edom. And Murray adds, there is a clear vehement quality here that cannot be discounted. Murray helps explain this by saying, we must therefore recognize that there is in God a holy hate 
that cannot simply be defined in terms of not loving or loving less. Now, he, he clarifies. He says, in God's hate, there is none of the unworthy features that belong to hate as exercised by sinful men. God's hate, he says, is therefore not malice, malignancy, vindictiveness, unholy rancor, or bitterness. And Murray acknowledges, it's difficult for us to find terms to adequately express this holy hate as it belongs to God. He concludes, he says, the hate of verse 13 belongs in the transcendent realm of God's sovereignty for which there is not a direct human analogy. So while we may not be able to to make a human analogy to God's hate here, what we can say, and I think what we must say, is in an awesome and solemn manner. What Paul is arguing is that God can, does, and has chosen some for salvation through faith in Christ. And He can, He does, and He has chosen some for positive disfavor, disapprobation, and displeasure. In short, divine judgment. Paul demonstrates here that God has done this in the very act of establishing Israel as a nation, choosing Isaac for the promised salvation and not Ishmael, choosing Jacob for the promised salvation and not Esau. And he is making this argument. He's going back into history showing this in order to make the case that God is not unfaithful in the present day if He chooses some Jews to believe in Jesus and to be part of His true spiritual people while rejecting others. Others who may be physical descendants of Abraham and Isaac, but spiritually they are like Ishmael and Esau. And this, in summary, is Paul's argument. So then we now ask the question, okay, so what are we to do with this argument this morning? Well, first, I think Paul would want us to rest in the fact that the promises of God are true. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. God's Word has not failed. He saves to the uttermost those who believe in His promises, those who believe in Jesus Christ. For those who believe, He persevere, He preserves us, He perseveres with us to the end through every danger, toil, and snare. And in it all, God remains utterly trustworthy. The old hymn states it well, we may trust Him fully, all of us who do. They who trust Him wholly, that is completely, find Him wholly true. And yet, this chapter, I think, is not only meant to encourage us with this truth, but to challenge us to say we must appropriate this truth at an intimate, personal level. The truth of God's sovereign election and the perseverance of the saints is not something that should be presumed upon because of our physical descent or our corporate identification, but rather it must be embraced with personal faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We should all stand in awe at the work of the sovereign God, but we must then believe in Him as our God and Savior. So the question I want to ask each of you this morning is, do you believe in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for your salvation? When I ask that question, do not say to yourself, oh yes, I grew up in a Christian home. Do not say, yeah, yes, I was baptized at a young age. Do not say, yes, for I go to Westminster Presbyterian Church on Sundays. Do not say, even, I am a member of that church. 
I tell you, you will not find your salvation in mere physical descent from Christian parents or grandparents. You will not find your salvation in church membership or mere participation in our corporate life together. What Paul says here, I say to you, with a little twist, not all who are born to Christian parents are true Christians. Not all who are part of Christian churches are true Christians. Brothers and sisters, it is true. The promises of salvation are for you and for your children, but they must be embraced and believed at the individual and personal level. You you must say in your heart, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, justly deserving God's displeasure and without hope save in His sovereign mercy. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of sinners, and I receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered in the gospel. For it is through this personal faith that you are able to say with confidence, I am united to Jesus Christ, and in Him I find my salvation. It is in this that you discover your personal assurance. It is in this that you can say with confidence, yes, I'm chosen by God, united to Him by faith. He he will surely preserve and persevere with me to the end. And it is in this that I stand secure in the hope of glory. My prayer for all of us this day is that we will, in fact, find assurance and confidence with Paul that the Word of God is true. It does not and it cannot fail. And I pray that we would all trust in the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. For then will we be able to know that we are chosen by God and secure in His love. May it be so for each and every one of us. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come. And we would not say, like the Jews of old, we have Abraham as our father, while dismissing the Christ, Abraham's seed. In a similar way, Lord, we we would protect us from saying this day, we have Christian parents and grandparents. We are connected to a good church while rejecting the Christ, crucified and risen, who is blessed, who is God, blessed forever. Oh, Lord, help us to know the, the Bible is true The promises of God are indeed true, so that we would not just affirm that in an intellectual way, but that we would believe them, that we would entrust ourselves to the God of our salvation, knowing that He will see us through to the very end, unto glory forever. May it be so for each one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's conclude our time together then, brothers and sisters, by singing a a great hymn of confidence in and declaration of the greatness of our sovereign God. Let's stand and sing hymn 73, Rejoice All People, Homage Give.
invite you as you're able to just be seated for a moment or so after the benediction to consider the greatness of our God and His sovereign grace during the piano postlude. Now receive this word from the Lord to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.